I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be able to be here in Vancouver and have the chance to meet and talk with so many people that are really engaged in trying to improve the healthcare system here. So uh, I promise not to dance. <laughs> uh, but I, I do want to talk this evening a little bit about what I call the promise of Medicare. And I want to share with you three big ideas that I think can help us to fulfill that promise. So to begin, I guess we'd, be, we'd better define what exactly is the promise of Medicare. For starters, it has to do with living our values, specifically the value of equity of access to healthcare services. Put simply, Canadians believe that access to healthcare should be based on need, not ability to pay. But Medicare binds us together in more ways than just by delivering health outcomes. It strengthens our economy, it improves our social stability, and very importantly, it gives us an example that we can point to of what our nation stands for. And I do think that that is why so many people watched that YouTube clip, is because it tapped into some of that pride about the, the fundamental premise that underpins our healthcare system. From coast to coast, as Canadian Doctors for Medicare has said, it is seen as the highest expression of Canadians caring for one another. So to me, that's the dual promise of Medicare, to deliver accessible, high quality healthcare services in an equitable way, and to give us something we can be proud of. Which means that when we think about improving Medicare, we need to think not only about how do you improve the delivery of healthcare services in an equitable way, which is frankly hard enough, but also we have to think about how do you make a social program worthy of iconic status. And there are lots of ideas out there about how we can do that. So the question is how do we choose? How do we pick which ones to try to advance? And I think that there is really only one thing that can help us to resolve the inevitable clash of ideologies and that is evidence. We cannot build our system on ideas that sound good or seem to make sense. We have to be willing to examine all the available data here and internationally to try to separate fact from fiction and failure from success. So to illustrate this, the importance of evidence in framing this conversation, I want to begin this evening by looking briefly at three critical elements of the Canadian healthcare system, cost, quality, and access and point out some important realities that I think frame the, the big ideas that I want to share with you tonight. So first, cost. We spend a lot on healthcare in Canada, 11.2% of our GDP last year, and that puts us in line with other OECD nations, but in the top third. But unlike most of our comparator countries, the proportion of that spending that is public is actually near the bottom. And this is something that I think many Canadians don't realize because we, uh, we always compare our healthcare system to the United States. In fact, for every dollar that we spend on healthcare in Canada, 70 cents is public. In France, that number is 77. In Norway, it's 86. We spend a lot of money on private insurance and out of pocket on services that are not covered by Medicare, such as prescription medications and dental care. And those numbers are increasing. A recent study by Statistics Canada found that since 1998, our average out-of-pocket health expenditures have been rising by 3% per year on top of inflation. But what we spend may not matter so much if we're getting good value for money. I mean, absolute dollars doesn't, doesn't speak to what, what, what we're getting for what we spend. And on many measures of health care quality, I would say we do reasonably well. Canadians report very high levels of satisfaction with the quality of our health care, with 71% giving good or very good ratings to the health care our families receive. And our health outcomes are quite consistent with that perception. Our average life expectancy is 81 years, which is a year ahead of the OECD average. Our infant mortality rates are lower than the average. We rank fourth out of 16 peer countries on mortality due to circulatory diseases like heart, attack, heart attacks and strokes, which are a leading cause of death in Canada. So this is all sounds pretty good, but let's be honest, there are places where we really need to improve. For example, one in every 12 hospitalized patients in Canada is readmitted to the hospital within, within 30 days of discharge. And one in every 10 patients discharged from hospital is seen in the emergency department within a week of leaving hospital. Too often, sick Canadians cycle in and out of the hospital, receiving treatment from different providers who don't coordinate and don't communicate. And I suspect that many of you, as healthcare providers or family members or in your own experience, have witnessed that phenomenon up close. But of course, the controversy about healthcare in Canada and whether Medicare really delivers the goods 
isn't really about cost or quality. It's about access. By and large, our job does a terrific job of, our system does a terrific job of delivering when people are seriously ill. And I think most of us are prepared to accept some amount of waiting in a system where we know that everyone has access. But the reality is that we still have a lot of work to do to reduce wait times in Canada for non-urgent medical care. A 2010 Commonwealth Fund study, study of 11 countries found that only 22% of Canadians can see their family doctor on the day they call for an appointment or the following day, which puts us well toward the bottom of the list of G7 countries. As the same survey placed us second last on wait times exceeding four months for elective and non-emergency surgery. Only the UK was worse. And British Columbia is among the provinces that's taking a lead in trying to remedy this problem by working to make sure that everybody has a family doctor and by stepping up measurement on wait times. All of that is a good start. But unfortunately, the problem is ongoing. The Wait Time Alliance gave BC a grade of B for achieving benchmark times for hip replacements, not so bad. Uh, but a grade of C for knee replacements, not so good. And when I teach uh, healthcare policy to the residents at the University of Toronto, B is the general grade that I give our healthcare, uh, our healthcare system on quality. Not so bad, not so perfect. So in the areas of cost, quality, and access, the evidence is clear. We have much to be proud of, and we have a lot of work to do. In scanning the policy environment, I see three big ideas out there that I think would truly raise the bar for Canadians' health in the next decade and help us to address these challenges of cost, quality, and access. I want to be clear that they're not my ideas, but they are well formulated, they are based in good evidence, and in my view, they meet the two key tests for delivering on the promise of Medicare. They would improve equity of health outcomes, and they are worthy of an iconic program. So tonight, with gratitude to the innovative thinkers who continue to develop new ways to improve our system, I want to dedicate these three ideas to three Canadian patients, because I think it's important that we remember who we're in this for. So here comes idea number one, 20 drugs to save a nation. We don't need to look south of the border to find health care that's inequitable, costly, and inefficient. An honest assessment of our approach to paying for prescription medications in Canada reveals a sorry state of affairs. At the time that Medicare was developed in the 1950s and 60s, and even into the 1980s with the passage of the Canada Health Act, the bulk of health care was delivered by doctors and in hospitals, which meant that our public health care system actually covered nearly all drugs because nearly all drugs were given to patients when they were in the hospital. But today, it's a completely different picture. Our systems are rapidly transforming to meet the needs of an aging population, and we have a population that's living longer, longer with chronic disease, and not doing so in hospitals, but in the community, which is where most of us would prefer to get our care. And let's be honest that one of the mainstays of treating chronic disease in the 21st century is prescription medicine. I'm not sure if you're aware that Canada is the only developed country in the world that has a universal healthcare in insurance model where that insurance does not cover prescription drugs. And the result is that one in 10 Canadians does not fill a prescription or take their medication as prescribed because of concerns about costs. The, that number, by the way, I know that, uh, that there's uh, a lot of debate about the program that you have in British Columbia. In fact, BC has the highest rate of medication non-adherence or people not taking their meds because of costs. That number is 17% here in BC, the highest in the country. So I'm dedicating idea number one to a patient in my own practice who will call Ahmed. Ahmed is a taxi driver of South Asian heritage. He lives in downtown Toronto with his wife and three beautiful kids, and he works long shifts behind the wheel. This, by the way, in spite of his university education and his perfect English. Like so many taxi drivers, his genetic heritage and his sedentary job have predisposed him to his medical problems of diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. Although he and his wife are careful in their spending, he simply cannot support his family and pay for his medically necessary medications, which cost hundreds of dollars per month. And even if he could figure out Ontario's complicated catastrophic drug coverage plan, he can't afford the deductible. So sometimes I just don't see him for long periods of time. And when that happens, I know that it's because he isn't taking his medicine and he doesn't want to disappoint me. I worry, as he does, about the complications he may experience in the coming decades 
some of which could be devastating, such as heart attacks, strokes, and blindness, because he cannot afford to both feed his family and pay for his medications. The most obvious way to fix this problem would be to bring all prescription drugs under Medicare, just as we've done for doctors and hospitals. But if we can't summon the political will to do that right away, let's focus first on those prescription medica medications that give us our biggest bang for the buck. Let's choose 20 or 50 or 100. You pick the number. Medications that are commonly used to control chronic diseases like asthma, diabetes, and high blood pressure. If we can agree nationally to go in on public coverage for those medications, we can cover them for everyone, including Ahmed. And if we did this, we would actually end up spending less publicly than we currently do. There are two major reasons for this. First, you may not realize that in Canada, we pay much higher prices for drugs than many other healthcare systems do, especially for generic drugs. If we could negotiate prices like the ones that are paid in other developed countries, we could easily cover the cost of 20 drugs to save a nation within our current public budgets. Just to give you an example, here in BC, 10 milligrams, a single 10 milligram pill of the cholesterol lowering medication Simvastatin currently goes for 36 cents. The exact same pill costs less than a penny in New Zealand. This is in spite of the fact that BC has been a national leader in terms of pushing down the price of generics. If we bargained more effectively together across the country, the prices for the drugs that we already buy publicly, for example, for all seniors and people on social assistance, would go down. Second, other systems achieve these huge savings by bulk buying their, pres their prescription drugs on a large scale. So just as we all know, you save your money on toilet paper if you buy those big things with 36 rolls in them, the same thing goes for medications. When you, when you, when you uh, consolidate your purchasing power, you can get much better uh, value for money. Between our public plans and our private plans, in Canada we literally have dozens of purchasers of the same set of prescription medications we would do much better with just one. Reforming our public insurance to include medicines is something that our public officials can do. But the rest of us, and I know there are lots of healthcare providers in the audience tonight, have a big role to play in fixing Medicare too. As providers, administrators, patients and citizens, we need to roll up our sleeves and get to work on idea number two, a concept I'm calling doing more with less. Doing more with less is about improving access to health care for Canadians who need it by reorganizing the way that services are delivered to people. It's not a single policy that can be implemented by passing a law. It represents a shift in our thinking, away from the presumption that the answer to our challenges in health care is always more. More money, more doctors, more tests, more machines, more procedures, an approach that has plagued the health care system for far too long. Instead, we need to start taking the resources available to us, and there are lots of them, and using them more intelligently. This means that where wait times are long, we don't immediately try to hire more surgeons or open more operating rooms. Instead, we ask two questions. First, will everybody on the wait list actually benefit from the proposed test or procedure? And second, where is the bottleneck causing the wait? Can we organize care better to improve the flow of patients through the system without spending more. So the first question, the question of whether the test or treatment will actually benefit the patient probably sounds silly to some of you. You're thinking of course it would benefit them, otherwise the doctor wouldn't have ordered it. Sadly, that's not always true. To illustrate this principle, I want to tell you about a patient we will call Sam, who came under the care of a cardiologist colleague of mine. Sam was a perfectly healthy man in his 60s. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't take any medications. In fact, he was a world-ranked athlete in a, sport, in a competitive sport. As part of his compensation package at a fancy downtown firm on Bay Street in Toronto, he went every year for an executive physical at a private clinic. One year, in spite of the fact that he felt perfectly well, he was subjected to an exercise stress test, just in case. Some potential abnormalities were identified. So in the end, he was sent for an angiogram, which is an invasive test to let looks to see if there is significant blockage around the vessels of the heart. Happily, the angiogram confirmed that Sam did not have heart disease, but not before he suffered a stroke on the table, a known complication of the procedure that occurs in approximately one in every thousand cases. 
This healthy athlete will never play his sport again because he's paralyzed on one side of his body as a direct result of a completely unnecessary and inappropriate test. So I know some of you are thinking, I have this debate with my partner all the time, but what if they'd found something? And wondering if the, works, the risks might not be worth it to pick up that one cancer or that one case of, of undiagnosed heart condition. But that's exactly the point. We need to stop thinking only about benefits and we need to start talking about harm. Friends, millions of Canadians are harmed every year by inappropriate, wasteful, and harmful tests and prescriptions. Radiologists agree, for example, that up to 30% of imaging scans do not contribute any useful information to the management of the patient's condition. And many of those scans involve radiation. To give you a sense of the impact, it's estimated that the quantity of excess radiation exposure from CT scans could cause the equivalent of 14,000 cancer deaths every year in the United States. Furthermore, eliminating useful, useless and inappropriate CT and MRI scanning would make a huge dent in our wait times for these important diagnostic tests for people who actually need them. It's for this reason that Canadian physicians are following the lead of our American counterparts and have launched a national campaign called Choosing Wisely Canada. As part of this campaign, medical societies across Canada are developing lists of the top five things that physicians and patients should question. The second question we ask when we try to do more with less is whether, whether the bottleneck causing the weight can be alleviated using creative approaches to get us better value for money. So I'm going to explain what I mean here using an example. When I first started practice a decade ago, if I had a patient who needed a knee replacement, I would refer them to the orthopedic surgeon whose name I could remember. And that person kept his wait list in the top drawer of his secretary's desk. And if he went on vacation for the month of August, the wait list just got longer. And if there were other surgeons who had longer wait times, I had no way of knowing that. Um, in fact, he could have a new graduate working in the office next door to him who had zero wait time and he could have a two year wait list and I wouldn't have any way of knowing that that was the case. Since that time, part of the concerted effort to reduce wait times in Ontario has included the introduction of centralized intake and assessment centers across the province. So now, when I refer a patient with late stage osteoarthritis of the knee, that person is seen within a week or two, not by a surgeon, by an advanced practice nurse practitioner and a physiotherapist. These highly trained professionals educate my patient about the nature of the disease, teach them exercises to improve their preoperative strength, counsel them on the importance of weight loss, and apply an evidence-based checklist to determine whether or not my patient is actually even a candidate for surgery. If they are a candidate for surgery, the patient is then offered a choice to either wait for the surgeon of their choosing or to see the next available surgeon. Using a very similar model of centralized intake in the public system, the Richmond Hospital Hip and Knee Reconstruction Project here in BC has reduced weights for artificial joint replacements down from 19 months to seven months. That's probably still too long, but it's a remarkable improvement. Centralized intake is a key theme arising in successful projects on weight. So I'd like to illustrate this important point uh, by giving you an example. At six o'clock at night when I'm rushing home to get to feed my five-year-old dinner, I stop at the grocery store, I grab whatever I need, and I head for the checkout line. And then I start the guessing game. You all know this, right? Which line do I choose? If I get into this one, if I, you know, if I choose the right line, I'm home in 12 minutes. If I choose the wrong line and it's a trainee or there's somebody counting out their change in front of me, it's gonna take me half an hour to get home. Now, if I make the same stop at the bank, I get in a single line, one line, and I'm served by the next available teller. The banks have figured out the beauty of applied queuing theory. The grocery stores have not. When you pick up dinner tomorrow, you can see this in action for yourself. By instituting a single common queue, we have dramatically improved the flow of patients through our orthopedic surgery suites, reduced wait times, and increased the appropriateness of those patients who are actually awaiting surgical consultation. But some approaches to bottlenecks cause more problems than they fix. As many of you know, Vancouver is ground zero for a legal challenge that threatens to undermine the very foundations of Medicare, namely that access to care be based on need rather than ability to pay. The owner of a private for-profit surgical center has sued the government of British Columbia and the Ministry of Health in hopes of making it legal for patients to buy their way to the front of the line. And for several years now, 
a number of BC surgeons have been operating in private for profit surgical centers, unlawfully treating those who can afford to pay ahead of those who can't. This kind of innovation threatens the social contract we all have with each, with each other, which is about implementing improvements to our healthcare system that benefit all our patients. The fact is that the innovations we need in our system don't require that we turn our backs on our values. And many of them aren't high tech or sophisticated. They don't always involve more. They can be as simple as a single phone number where there used to be many, or as obvious as the better use of teams so that surgeons aren't the rate limiting ingredient in access to care. And if we use evidence to address challenges like waitlist and rigorously evaluate changes that we make to see if they're working, we can ensure that any new investments are well spent. This brings me to the last idea and to a patient in my practice we'll call Leslie. Leslie suffers some, from severe asthma. She takes multiple puffers and she's been on and off prednisone, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory drug with significant side effects many times to try to control her symptoms. She's been seen by multiple specialists and she's been in and out of the emergency department dozens of times. Leslie's asthma started when the social housing unit she lives in had a flood. Mold grew inside the walls of the building and her health began to deteriorate. She took pictures of the mold and she showed them to her landlord. Her doctors, including me, wrote letters of support begging them to find her another unit or another building to move into. It took her and us two years to get the system to respond. During that period of time, her physical and mental health deteriorated. She became depressed, unsurprisingly. Her relationship fell apart. She wasn't able to hold down a steady job. She was coughing so much. She gained weight and her blood pressure worsened because she couldn't exercise due to her breathing problems. As my colleague, Dr. Ryan Miley would say, Leslie isn't sick with asthma. She's sick with poverty. She is sick with a lack of access to appropriate housing, decent food, and the basic human dignity that comes along with being able to make the choices we all want to make to stay healthy. The third idea I want to talk about is a proposal that can be explained without even a, even a passing reference to healthcare. Yet acting on it would do more, would do more to improve the health of the, of the country than any single other policy that we could support. Decades of studies have demonstrated that as important as healthcare is, it does not play the primary role in determining whether or not people will be ill or well. Social factors, like the ones that les led to Leslie's illness, have a much more powerful impact on the most meaningful outcomes. Income is the strongest predictor of health. Low-income Canadians are more likely to die earlier and to suffer more illnesses than Canadians with higher incomes, regardless of age, sex, race, and place of residence. So addressing poverty is one of the most important things we can do to improve health. Dr. Gary Block at St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto often quotes one of his patients who once said to him, Doc, if you want to make me better, get me more money. And that is idea number three, a basic income to bring all Canadians up to a decent standard of living. Basic income is a well-developed approach to reducing poverty by using the tax system. It's pretty simple. Every year you file your taxes. If you fall below a certain level, you get topped up to a level sufficient to meet basic needs. It's an alternative to costly and bureaucratic social assistance programs that would virtually eliminate poverty in Canada. As Senator Hugh Siegel has pointed out, this is not a radical policy. In 1975, in Ontario where I live, we had a poverty rate among seniors of 35%, most of whom were women. The Davis government at the time, there was a, their Toronto Star ran a series of articles showing seniors who were living on cat food in their, uh, in their apartments. The Davis government at the time implemented a basic tax-based seniors income top-up that then spread across the country and formed the basis of our current old age security program, which many of you will be familiar with. In three years, the poverty rate among seniors went from 35% to 3%. There are very few social policy decisions in our lifetimes that have had that kind of impact. And there's pretty good evidence that a broader population-based basic income policy improves health. In Dauphin, Manitoba in the 1970s, a basic income supplement offered to all the eligible residents in a small town reduced hospitalization, particularly for admission related to mental illness, and reduced accidents and injuries. 
A study done in Gary, Indiana found that families provided with an income top-up saw positive effects on birth weights in newborn babies across the entire community. Part of what makes these experiments tick isn't simply the money in people's pockets, although certainly that helps in terms of putting food on the table or paying your electricity bill. Income security means that even those families who never collect a penny know that they, if they were to fall on hard times, they wouldn't lose everything. And that has positive effects on the health of the entire community, not just the people who receive the supplement. In fact, basic income is very much like Medicare or any other insurance policy. We all pay in, we all hope we won't have to use it, but if we do, there isn't a humiliating process of having to prove our worthiness in order to have our medical bills paid or put food on the table for our kids. The same principles that led us to establish universal health insurance underpin the basic income. Administrative simplicity, risk pooling, and the belief that access to some basic things should be automatic, a right of citizenship rather than an act of charity. Given that the Manitoba experiment was nearly 40 years ago, it's been suggested by many experts that a series of pilots should take place across the country to figure out how we would design a program like this for a 21st century Canada. We should get started tomorrow. Let me close this evening by acknowledging that almost everyone in this audience has strong views about what we should do to improve health. And it's almost certain that some of you are disappointed that I didn't mention the solution you were hoping, to, hoping for. There are obviously hundreds of good ideas where these three came from, and most of you are here because you believe, as I do, that Medicare is worth the investment of our ongoing collective energy. But I do think that the test we should apply as to whether or not we focus on any particular solution should be the one that I articulated at the outset, namely that solutions should actually reinforce the value of equity and that they should be worthy of the enormous importance we place on our most cherished social program. And when we set out to design those solutions, we should do so based on the best available evidence, unapologetically devoting time, energy, and resources to study the effects of our interventions in healthcare systems so that we can learn whether or not they actually work. So, no more tinkering around the edges. 20 drugs to save a nation, doing more with less, and basic income. If we start moving to do these three things, we will see substantial improvements in the health of Canadians. Canadians like Ahmed, Sam, and Leslie, like you and me. We need to take action worthy of Medicare. Let's go get started. We have a promise to keep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for sharing three uh, big ideas. Uh, certainly inspiring. They seem so simple on the one hand, um, but I'm sure the audience has questions for you. So we now have an opportunity to engage in some discussion and for you to be thinking about your questions. There are people with microphones in the room, and I'm going to ask that you put up your hand and that um, we get a microphone to you. Um, and the reason we're using the mics in part is because we have people um, joining us um, uh, virtually as well. And I'll rem remind people virtually who want to join us and ask a question to use hashtag three big ideas. So there is a question at the back of the room and uh, we can get started. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danielle. That was terrific. And I love the fact that your number one idea was the one that I wanted to <laughs> talk about. Phew. Uh, I'm a pharmacologist emeritus from UBC and uh, also on the board of the Bloom Group. And it's always interested me, for whatever reason, because it was 1955, 56, why our fathers and mothers of our wonderful healthcare system did not think about the fact that what I will call universal pharmacare is really the most critical part of how we move forward. And I always told my students, and still do, that would you want to live in a country where there are hundreds of people buying medications, including a provincial government in 10 provinces and two territories, paying anywhere between, as you said, one cent to 28 cents, with big pharma and generics laughing their way to the bank on our expense? And I think that that's something that is so simple, but 
the question I have for you, because that was a comment, yes. was, <laughs> and I'm sure everybody in the room agrees with me, but the comment is, how do we get the federal program to be really universal when we have provincial programs that really run a significant amount, and Danielle, you probably know what percentage, of our healthcare system, including buying the meds? How do we get over that? So it's a great question. Um, and just to comment on your comment to say that, you know, this issue of access to affordable medication is, uh, you know, it's obviously not a problem that's unique to Canada, although it's not a problem that exists in most other developed countries. It's a big problem in the developing world. It's a big problem in the U.S. There's a terrific campaign called Access Our Medicines uh, based out of Vancouver here that's doing some great work. And there's a declaration online, if you just look them up, that you can sign on to because, of, of course, access to medicines is, a, is an issue internationally, especially as more and more disease, uh, more and more of the disease burden internationally is, is chronic disease as opposed to acute disease. Uh, the question that you're asking about implementation, you know, interestingly, in 2004, when the premiers met in Niagara, I think it was 2004, and someone can correct me if I've got the year wrong, in Niagara-on-the-Lake, I think it was the first meeting ever of the Council of the Federation, um, you know, which is when the premiers come together without the prime minister. The premiers, I was there, the premiers stood up in front of the microphones, you know, all in a line with their suits and their flags behind them, and they said, you know, we've had a big discussion and we've, we've uh, decided what we think we need to do to move forward the healthcare agenda in Canada. We hereby declare that we wish to upload all pharmacare to the federal government. And the federal government said, eh, no thanks. Um, and that, you know, we literally, we watched that window of opportunity open and then we watched it close. So I don't actually think that on the issue of pharma spending, the provinces are territorial or that the territories are provincial either. I think everybody sort of, uh, everybody would be on board with that. The, the mechanics of how you would do it, I think there are, you know, unlimited options. So. You could do a national, uh, truly national body, some arm's length body of government that would set the formulary and do all the bulk purchasing, which is sort of how they do it in New Zealand. You could simply have a national formulary and a single purchaser and then administer the claims provincially. There are really any number of ways that you could do it. And as I say, given how much the provinces are currently spending, and the federal government too. So remember, this is what the provinces and the federal government spend on pharma. They, they, they pay for uh, all the, virtually all the medications for people over 65 and people on social assistance. They pay catastrophic drug coverage. So anyone who spends over, let's say, 4 or 5% of their income on drugs, depending on the plan, public coverage kicks in and they pay for private insurance for all their own public sector employees, which is a huge amount of money. Like anybody who works for government has a good drug plan, right? That's all tax dollars. So if you put all of that money together, you actually have a very large pool of funds available to finance a universal system of some kind. Um, you know, that's a, it's not a complete answer to your question, but I don't, I don't actually think that the uh, resistance is at the provincial level um, in this particular on this particular file. There's a question up in the front here. Oh, he's got a question. Go ahead. Dr. Martin. Yes. We'll start here. Um, uh, I wonder if you could tell me um, what your thoughts are. Uh, Canadians are pretty well known for not taking to the streets with pitchforks and flaming torches. How do we galvanize change in this country amongst the citizenry to um, say, this is not working? and we need to fix it. Uh, it's a very big question, mm -hmm. but um, I just wondered what your thoughts were on it. Do you mean on pharmacare or just more generally around these yeah, kinds more of reforms? Generally, just around healthcare, wait times, pharm pharmacological costs. How, how do we affect change? How can Canadians affect change? Baby steps even. Right, I mean, I actually think this kind of thing is a good start. My own impression, because I've been doing a lot of um, public speaking since the whole YouTube thing. Um, and uh, my impression is that people are really relieved to finally have a conversation about health care that is positive. And part of the, I mean, of course we have problems, of course we need to address our problems, but people are sick of the rhetoric of it's not sustainable, the sky is falling, you know, it, we, we can't possibly do this anymore. And people get excited about the idea that we could do something well, we could do something better, we could do something good. And so I actually think a lot of the 
um, impetus for engaging the public needs to not be around the negativity of the of the you know pitchforks and picket signs and more around that how do we get communities engaged to move a good idea ahead and and my impression although it's obviously not an unbiased sample but my impression is people really respond to that I've been blown away by the response to that and so I don't know if it's letters to the editor and your member of parliament and attending meetings and joining Doctors for Medicare and doing all that kind of stuff. It's, of course, a, a combination of all of those ways that we can all get involved civically. But I actually think the key to engaging the Canadian public on these issues is to stop with the negativity and, you know, and come forward with good ideas about how to make things better. Thank you. So there's a question here, and then there's a question here, and then here. Um, on the Pharmacare issue, a somewhat 